Are you a nasty boy or girl that secretly enjoys the smell of sweat? Well, you might just like the effects of pheromones. A compound that is generally considered a human pheromone is secreted mostly in male sweat. This molecule is androstadienone, a derivative of the steroid hormone testosterone. There are several studies that investigated the effects of androstadienone on mood and attractiveness. One study tested the effects of androstadienone at a speed dating event in which men and women interacted in a series of brief encounters. Men were rated more attractive when assessed by women who had been exposed to androstadienone, which suggests that it can influence women's attraction to men. In another study, androstadienone enhanced the perceived attractiveness from the opposite sex, including from men to women. The response time was also affected by androstadienone. Men and fertile women responded slower, while non-fertile women responded faster. Some sources mentioned that for homosexual men, it increased the attractiveness perception of men, but not women, indicating that the increased attraction is only towards the gender you are already attracted to. However, I couldn't find the study, or it might be hidden somewhere in some data. Another study found that exposure to androstadienone made women more focused and had a positive effect on psycho-psychological arousal and mood. However, mood effects were only evident when an experimenter of the opposite sex conducted the testing which suggests that social context is important. Basically, it requires a man to be present for it to trigger. Further, it was also found that androstadienone does not influence social generosity in men or women. A study also revealed that for men, smelling androstadienone reduced both reactive and proactive aggression, whereas it increased reactive aggression in women. But how does it influence behavior between men? One study researched the effects between men using a monetary game and the results indicate that androstadienone increased individualistic responses, while it decreased cooperative responses. These findings support the role of androstadienone as a threatening signal of dominance that elicits behavioral avoidance and social withdrawal tendencies, possibly as a submissive response. Furthermore, repeated exposure causes a decrease in the detection threshold of more than four orders of magnitude. And thirdly, Accompanying this sensitization process is a change in perceived odor quality, which makes it smell predominantly putrid. Now we know a bunch of behavioral effects of this pheromone that can potentially be advantageous to use in a perfume, and seemingly it is already used in some perfumes, but I'm not sure how much. Generally, perfume formulations aren't public. Either way, I want to smell it myself and see if there's any effect, and I might try to wear it for real another time. Only one step away from androstadienone is the molecule phase dienol. Phase dienol as a nasal spray is currently in phase three clinical trials for the treatment of social anxiety disorder, while also being investigated for generalized anxiety disorder and PTSD. So as a bonus, I will also make this one and try it out to see how it affects the mood. To make all this, I will start with an ester of the steroid testosterone, called testosterone cypionate. Since testosterone esters are widely used as an anabolic steroid, and medicinally for testosterone replacement therapy, it is one of the most convenient and cheapest starting materials to make the human pheromone androstadiena. But first, I will have to remove the ester to get free testosterone. So to get started, I set up a flask with a stir bar in a heating mantle and add in 160 ml of the solvent dichloromethane. I then also add 160 ml of water as a second solvent, creating a biphasic mixture since these two solvents don't mix. Into the water, I dissolve 8 grams of sodium hydroxide as a base. And finally, as a starting material, 2 grams of testosterone cypionate, which is just a white powder and will dissolve into the dichloromethane. I wash out the beaker with a bit more dichloromethane, and I then allow this mixture to stir strongly at 30 C overnight. Since neither testosterone cypionate nor the product testosterone are soluble in water, Using a second solvent like dichloromethane and then stirring it strongly will help it react while staying dissolved. Without that, it would just get clumpy and the reaction would potentially not go to completion. Now the testosterone product will also move into the dichloromethane layer, while the resulting cypionate salt stays in the water layer, allowing for easy separation. This reaction is a typical basic ester hydrolysis, also called saponification. In this case, the cypionate ester is removed to give free testosterone and the salt sodium cypionate. How it proceeds is first through nucleophilic attack of a hydroxyl onto the ester's carbonyl carbon, moving a pair of the double bond electrons onto the oxygen. In the resulting intermediate, this double bond returns and kicks off testosterone as an alkoxide and leaving cypionic acid. The acid is quickly deprotonated by the alkoxide as it is a much stronger base. 
giving the neutral testosterone and the salt sodium cypionate. When I returned, I turned off the stirring and removed the heat, and it separated into two layers, with the dichloromethane layer containing the product on the bottom. I separate these layers and extracted the water layer two more times with dichloromethane to make sure nothing is left behind and I then moved it all to this dish. I start heating it and stirring it to simply boil off all of the solvent. Afterward, a yellowish solid is left behind that I scrape off. It's not uncommon for testosterone to be slightly yellow. Even pharmaceutical testosterone esters are often slightly yellow. When I scraped it all off, the weight turned out to be 1.6 grams, which is a yield of 114%. We would expect a yield close to 100% for this reaction, not above. But in this case, it likely still has some DCM or water inside, as I didn't want to heat it too much, giving an inflated number. It isn't relevant for the next reaction, so I will just continue with this and assume the yield was 100%. For the next reaction, I will dissolve all of the testosterone into the base pyridine. I use that to wash out the dish with the remaining material, and I aimed for about 20 to 40 mils, but I don't know how much exactly I put in. I then allow it to stir and dissolve, and when that's done, I take out the reagent phosphorus oxychloride, of which I pipette 4 mils directly into the pyridine. Upon addition, the mixture loses most of its yellow color, but it gradually returns as it reacts. I then set the flask in a heating mantle and attach the condenser. I heat this mixture to a reflux overnight, however, it only needs a few hours. Potentially, it can even stir overnight at room temperature, which might be a little bit easier on the molecule. In this reaction, the alcohol of testosterone is dehydrated to an alkene. The mixture of pyridine and phosphorus oxychloride is a typical mixture to dehydrate alcohols and will work for many substrates. Since steroid chemistry is just alkane chemistry, there are no exceptions that need to be considered. How it proceeds is first through nucleophilic attack of the alcohol onto the phosphorus oxychloride, of which the proton is taken up by the base pyridine and the kicked off chloride ion is also taken up to form pyridine hydrochloride. The formed intermediate phosphoester is a great leaving group because of the two remaining chlorines that are attached. Because of that, the adjacent proton has a significant increase in acidity, allowing it to be deprotonated by the pyridine. Those bond electrons move to form a double bond, and the phosphoester is kicked off to give the pyridinium dichlorophosphate salt, and the product androstadiene. When I return, it has become black, and the condenser shows some salts crystallizing in the condenser, which is likely one of the pyridine salts. Then to destroy all excess phosphorochloride and wash down these salts, I just pour some water directly through the condenser. It gives an initial strong reaction with the phosphorochloride, but it is quickly destroyed and only remains hot. Now to convert all the pyridine to its hydrochloride salt and dissolve it in water, I add in 30 ml of 37% hydrochloric acid. Now to extract the product, I add in a bunch of the solvent diethyl ether, which will also cool down the mixture because of its low boiling point. And when that's done, I move all of it to a separatory funnel, but the layers don't separate because it has formed an emulsion. To fix this, I add some more ether on top and then force the emulsion to break by adding in some saturated sodium chloride solution, which will drastically increase the polarity of the water phase, causing the two solvents to repel each other more strongly. I then mix it around and the layers separate normally, but there is also a bunch of solid floating around that makes it more difficult to see. I just take the yellow ether layer and then extract the water phase twice more with ether. After that, I am left with the ether layer containing the product and some solid junk that holds onto water. To absorb this, I add in a bunch of the salt sodium sulfate, and I can then filter it through some cotton into a dish to get rid of all the solids without any water seeping through. Then like earlier, I heat it to boil off all the solvent and put it in the freezer afterward, giving this yellow solid that I mostly scraped down. I moved most of it to a vial and keep some residue in the dish to test out. The smell of the solid is mild, but exactly like a component of sweat. This is something you would smell in a men's locker room, or if you smell your old polyester clothes that you have sweat in. It isn't really appalling, and you can kind of feel it do something deep inside your nasal cavity, like a sensation or aching. That's probably because at this concentration, it kind of overloads the receptors. Now to make a simple perfume, I have this spray vial and I can just dissolve the residual material in ethanol. When that's done, I prepare it all into vials, and I can then put some on my wrist to test out.
When it dries, it just makes my skin smell a bit sweaty, especially from up close. I kept it on for a whole day and it was noticeable up close for more than 16 hours. Occasionally, I would catch a whiff of it while just living and my nasal cavity was a bit triggered for some hours. Putting this all over yourself would probably be really extreme and smell bad. I think two sprays are enough, just on the clothes or in the neck, and then covered with another perfume to mask the scent. In general, I would say it improved my mood, but it's really difficult to know exactly if it is related, especially because I knowingly inhaled it, and I'm not about to run a whole study. If it makes me more attractive, we'll have to see another time because it doesn't work on myself. Something I can try on my own, what I can and will try, and that should be more noticeable, is to transform part of the antrostadienone into the anti-anxiety medication phase dienol. Like I said before, phase dienol works against acute anxiety and is administered via nasal spray. They say to take two doses 30 minutes apart for when you anticipate anxiety to come. But it should also work against mildly triggering situations or just in general to reduce anxiety and that should be noticeable. And those things should also generally affect the mood. This medication doesn't exist on the market yet since it's still in clinical trials. There exist other medications to deal with acute anxiety, such as benzodiazepines, but these come with a wide side effect profile that generally hinders proper physical and cognitive performance. That should not be the case for phase dienol, so it would make a great alternative. To make phase dienol only requires a reduction of the ketone to an alcohol, while leaving the alkenes untouched. That can easily be done with the common reducing agent lithium aluminum hydride. So to get started, I set up a flask with a stir bar into which I add 0.2 grams of androstat dieno. I dissolve this in 20 ml of the solvent tetrahydrofuran and then add in 60 mg of the reducing agent lithium aluminum hydride. I cover the flask in parafilm and then allow it to stir for a day at room temperature. In this reaction, the ketone of androstat dieno is reduced to an alcohol, with lithium aluminum hydride giving the product phase dienol. The reaction proceeds typically for this type of reduction. Lithium aluminum hydride easily reduces carbonyls, but leaves alkenes alone, because they are not electrophilic. So the hydride of lithium aluminum hydride is a nucleophile that can attack the carbonyl carbon, forcing a pair of the carbonyl double bond electrons onto the oxygen, and the remaining aluminum hydride complexes with the oxygen. When this reaction is done, we can destroy the complex with water, giving basic lithium and aluminum salts, which can be neutralized with some dilute acid, giving the final product phase dienol. When I return, it has become grey, which seems quite typical for this reaction, and I then add in some water. I also add in a few drops of hydrochloric acid, and I leave this to stir strongly for a few hours. After that, it has become transparent yellow again, and I force the separation of the water and the tetrahydrofuran by adding a saturated sodium chloride solution, as well as some diethyl ether, which is not miscible with water. The salts will go into the water layer, while the product goes into the organic layer. It's separated into two layers, and I moved it all to a separatory funnel. I discard the bottom water layer and take the top organic layer. Ideally, you extract the water layer a few more times with ether. To the organic layer, I add some sodium sulfate to absorb remaining water. I then simply decant half the solvent into a dish while the salts stay behind. I heat it again to remove all the solvents and a transparent glassy layer is left behind that I allow to sit in the freezer to solidify properly. With some work, it can now be scraped off and forms a slightly yellow powder. When that's done, I moved it all into a vial and the yield turned out to be 0.11 grams, or about 55%, assuming this and the starting material are dry and pure. Now I have already explained what this molecule is for, but I need a nose spray and saline. Luckily, no saline sprays exist, so I went to the store to find one. After having snatched one, I open it up and it's just one of those simple pumps and I measured it to give off a little less than 0.1 grams per spray. Now phase dienol won't dissolve in just water, so put about 1.5 mL of the safe and edible solvent dimethyl sulfoxide in a vial and I will put a tiny scoop of the phase dienol in there, which is generally 10 to 40 mg. In clinical trials, they use an extremely small amount, in the order of micrograms per spray, but their exact formulation is not detailed. 
Since the action of this compound seems to be dependent on the pheromone receptors or a related mechanism, it is likely that spraying more will just result in it being wasted. But at least we will know that there is enough. With some dimethyl sulfoxide, it mixes normally with the saline solution. So I just put all of it into the sprayer, giving a total remaining volume of about 12 mils. That means each mil contains about 1 to 4 milligrams. One spray will therefore be 85 micrograms to 340 micrograms. I will just snort several sprays to really get it in there properly. and it felt and tasted bad. Since I wasn't doing much, I can't speak for its anxiety effects, but I did notice after about 30 minutes, I was in a weirdly jolly mood for no reason, and overall, I was fine. Perhaps I will try it again another time before a stressful situation. Anyhow, that was it, see ya.